so the BMW event is going really well. There's lots of nice BMWs from Melbourne. BMW's new Retail Next corporate identity um, standards. And um, this new retail format that was envisaged um, was to really focus on three key topics. One, digital, and you'll see plenty of examples of digital around from the spec stands to the 217 inch um, media wall there, uh, kiosk downstairs and the like. Sustainability, and kind of cool that we're standing right next to our, um, our green wall here that's live and, and whatever else, and all the things that go into that. And customer centricity in hand. Um, but you're not here to listen to me, um, to hear the uh, this evening to listen to John Paul. Enjoy tonight, thank you. Hello. All right, so I thought I'd uh, introduce Joe over here. And I've got to say, this dealership is really nice. It's much nicer than the warehouse I picked my Tesla up in. <laughs> so, thank you for having us. Um, so Joe is uh, not only a legend of a bloke, but um, really sort of well-connected in the BMW world. We met uh, ages ago with, with our last business, Car Advice, when uh, our CEO at the time, it was a bit... Uh, Nutty decided to bring Joe out and gave him literally nothing to do while he was here. Uh, so I, I got sort of lumped with going to do a video with Joe and I thought, mm, okay, this will be interesting. And he ended up being an absolute legend of a guy and we had so much fun. So, uh, mate, thank you for coming out to Australia and thank you for putting everything together tonight uh, to have us uh, all in one space with you. No, thanks, mate. Uh, it's been awesome. Uh, big thanks to Daniel and his team for hosting us down here at Melbourne BMW. It's an unbelievable show, as you can all see. And uh, huge thanks to Nick as well, uh, wherever you are. There you are. Thank you very much, mate. Um, yeah, I know he can't wait for me to go back to the UK because uh, I'm constantly, every day, it's like, Nick, Nick, can we do this? Nick, can we do that? Um, and also, massive thanks to everyone for making the effort coming down because uh, yeah, I'm still actually a little bit shocked. Um, Standing out there, I just honestly, it was amazing. I mean, how many BMWs have I seen in my life? Probably too many, but you can't get enough. And uh, all the M cars, uh, especially in this light, I think just looks outstanding. So, uh, yeah, thanks to everyone for coming down. I really, really appreciate it and appreciate the love and support around the channel as well because uh, I wouldn't be doing what I do without you guys and girls, basically. Well said. Um, so tonight's sort of fairly informal. We genuinely thought it was just going to be three or four people here. So what's <laughs> What's a lot of pressure on us? I brought my fans along as well, mate. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, look, I just thought I'd run through some questions for you. I know we got a stack of questions from Instagram as well. Um, there's also another topic I wanted to touch on as well. Uh, actually, I might start with that topic before we get into the questions because it's a bit of a tricky one. Um, a little while back, uh, Joe had a run-in with the police, and uh, I know our highway patrol here isn't uh, the friendliest of people sometimes, but uh, over in the UK, they really do take it to another level. Uh, Joe filmed a video with, was it an R8? Yep. Uh, driving up a snake pass? Snake pass. Snake yeah. pass. And uh, someone in the, the highway patrol over there decided to go frame by frame in this video and uh, declare that Joe was speeding. Do you want to run us through how that all went down and uh, what the outcome was at the end of it as well? Yeah, well, it's a really long story, so I'm not going to bore you with it too much, but um, it is something that's taught me a lesson and I think taught a lot of UK YouTubers and journos a lesson. Um, I filmed a little clip. You couldn't see me, you couldn't see the speedo, you couldn't see anything. And it wasn't even a clip about me going fast along this particular road. It was just uh, demonstrating the wonderful V10 and a bit of a sort of dynamic shot, if you like. 
Um, but yeah, months later, I get something through the post, uh, and they'd investigated me. But they'd investigated me massively. They'd spent up to that point, I reckon, about fifty thousand pounds on experts. Um, they obviously wanted me, they wanted to make an example of me. Uh, it went through it went for about a year. It almost bankrupted me because obviously I've never sort of dealt with the legal system before. And when you're defending yourself, it's really difficult um, unless you've got loads of loads of money to do it. Um, but long story short, I, I thankfully kept my license and proved most of my innocence around it because uh, they tried to um, frame me for something that I didn't even do. Um, and thankfully, the judge saw all of that. But yeah, it was a it was a hellish experience to go through. And uh, but as I say, it taught me a lesson. And if anyone else here films stuff, just um, yeah. Basically, don't speed. It's the main thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, trust me, they know. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that's a whole another topic. I'm not. Yeah, I've been so paranoid over here, like because I know I came out a few years ago. My brother's here, Jack, and his lovely uh, other half, Ronnie, and um, and uh, I, I remember I jumped in his car whenever it was last time. I think I was here, and I was sitting at like 105 on the highway, and my brother was like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, <laughs> he's, he's, "He said you're speedy." I was like, oh, "It's 105." I'm not even. So yeah, this time I'm literally on the limit everywhere. The speed limiter actually, and the BMWs comes in hand. I've never used that before, but it's great because you can just keep your foot pinned, pretend that you're going fast. But it just, so uh, yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah. Well, look, uh, it's one of those humbling experiences, I guess, you've got to you know, go through. Uh, but that brings you, well, you got your blue tick after that, because you got so many uh, mentions in the media that someone thought you were important, so that was, I guess, an upside from that <laughs> situation. Uh, do you want to run us through your BMW ownership history? Because I know that you're big into the brand, I know that you've diversified now into other brands on, on YouTube as well, but run us through your, your affinity with BMW and where it all started. Other brands? Me? No way. <laughs> um, so, yeah, well, early days, uh, my first BM was 2006, 130i. Uh, that was awesome. I couldn't afford it at all at the time. I took out a stupid bank loan. And, uh, yeah, I don't know how I don't know how and why. I did it. Literally, I couldn't afford to put fuel in it. it was, <laughs> the payments were so big. Uh, but that, that's where my love started. But actually, no, it isn't. If, if you go back to when I was seven or eight, um, my brother and I have got an auntie called Janon who lives in the south of France and uh, her husband Nick used to have company cars which was really rare back then especially in France and his company car was an E30 325i Sport um, yeah absolute I mean oh, what a car and so I used to love going on these family holidays for that reason only uh, and when, when I was tall enough my auntie would let me drive they had this long lovely sort of dirt driveway it was about two kilometres and so when I was tall enough, I used to be able to sit on her lap and drive. And then as I got tall enough to actually reach the pedals at probably the age of nine, ten, um, I used to drive this car up and down the driveway. Literally, all the time, my parents would be like, where's Joe? Like, whatever. Uh, so that's where my BMW love started when I was really young. Um, and then, yeah, I could blame them for, for the money it's cost me over the years since. But um, yeah, 130i, then much later, 330ci manual. That was nice. Um, and then... Then I went one series a bit obsessed, so I went 120D, which is more of a work commute car, then M135i, then another M135i, then an M140Z, uh, and an M2 at the time. I had them both for a bit. Um, and then, uh, yeah, non-comp, that was the original one. And then I can't remember, two or three M3s, and then my F87 M2 comp, which is currently super lightweight. It's a bit sort of light around the front end because it doesn't have an engine in it. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, now I've got the Touring, uh, MP Touring, which I absolutely love. Uh, it is the car that does everything. It's almost too... I find that the G-Series is so good now, uh, especially the Touring, and I'm not just saying this because I'm here, um, but they, are just, they just do everything. And I think the M3 Touring is a car that does so many things so well that you kind of just take it for granted. Do you know what I mean? It's almost like... Every time I get in it, I just use it as a normal car, and then when you find a nice road and you hammer it a little bit, you, you just you you forget how good and capable it is, and that thing's even better, which is scary. Um, but anyway, well, I mean, in a world where uh, Mercedes Benz is uh, with the next generation of C63 that made it four cylinder and weigh as much as a Hilux, um, <laughs> I really think that there are depressing times ahead for for brands that aren't BMW. I hope I hope BMW does not go down that path. Um, so you were a chauffeur at one point as well, and one of your clients was uh, Cara Delevingne. 
Um, tell us about her and, and chauffeuring as well. So they thought you were together at one point, right? Oh, yeah, well, you know, the media make up loads of stuff, so, uh, but I didn't mind those stories. <laughs> I was like, oh, look what they've written about me, what a shame, I put it all over social media. Um, but, yeah, so I, um, I worked in the fashion industry for many years, and so I got to know Cara very well back then um, as a kid, and then she grew up, and, uh, and then I ended up chaperoning her and a lot of things and driving her to events throughout Europe or whatever. Uh, but I was like a trusted figure to her and, and a daddy. Um, like a daddy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your daddy? <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, no, and uh, yeah, I always just thought of her as, as my as my sort of younger sister almost. Um, and uh, and and she was responsible for me getting out. I just couldn't deal with it. It was a it was a pretty full on job. Uh, hours were crazy, uh, stressful. My boss was was slightly. You know, like honestly, like she was full on, um, but it taught me a lot about life and it, it toughened me up a little bit. Uh, but I eventually managed to find a way to set up this business that got me away from this sort of nine to five sitting at this screen, and uh, and then yeah, and then I looked after her and various other sort of pretty major supermodels at the time uh, for years, and that kept me busy. Uh, and it also gave me some spare when I had spare time, because like anything, when you're self-employed. Sure, a lot of you can relate to this. You're either super busy or you're very quiet. Uh, so then when I got my first M135i 10 years ago, last month, um, I started filming little videos on it because I had this spare time and the internet wanted to know, you know, like there was forums and stuff. How do you activate the launch control? How do you do this? How do you do that? So that's how it all sort of started. But it just started as a bit of a hobby. Um, yeah, completely as a hobby. Never, ever dreamt that it would be a living one day. And uh, yeah, here I am with all these lovely people, and you. <laughs> I did actually notice there's a bunch of GoPros and people filming stuff around here. Um, as someone as well that, that does YouTube stuff, I know how much of a pack of thieves they are when it comes to paying you. Um, do you want to run people through how that whole ecosystem works and, and when you do a video, what you get in return for it, uh, especially for those that are doing a similar thing or want to do a similar thing and, and create video content as a job? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I think people look at YouTube and YouTubers as earning a lot of money and a lot of what you see is smoke and mirrors uh, and a lot of, like for instance, my Infleet Touring, I don't need that car but I have it because it's part of my channel so it's, you know, it's a business expense, it's a tool. Um, but yeah, I mean, you've got a massive YouTube channel uh, which you have worked very hard on and so you can relate to this and I'm sure there are others but a couple of years ago, YouTube, YouTube ad revenue was really good. Uh, views were better, ad revenue was better, uh, manufacturers were pouring in more advertising, so it all kind of worked together. Uh, and you'd make, you could sometimes make two, two and a half grand on a good video, which was you know, amazing. Uh, but nowadays, it's, it's completely changed. And I don't like complaining, I don't really talk about it much, because I don't like complaining about what I do, because I love what I do, I'm here because of what I do, and I'm very grateful about that. But it's changing so much that I think by mid of next year, unless I do something different, I'm not going to be making a living out of YouTube. And, and everyone's feeling the pinch, even people like Shmi, cheers! Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but even like bigger YouTubers are really feeling that pinch. I mean, he's, he's got like 20 super hyper cars or whatever. So uh, it's all relative, isn't it? But it's, it is tightening down and the ad revenue is getting worse and the views are getting relatively worse. Uh, so it's a hard thing to maintain and that's kind of part of the reason I wanted to come out here and do the daily stuff was just to see if, if that would do something with the algorithm because uh, you're always trying to find that sweet spot, aren't you? Um, I think short form content has killed long form content as well to a certain extent and it's, it's hard because I think I know marketing teams and people focus on short form and we're all like just as bad, you know, I'll get up in the morning and get into a, what's it called, a real hole or something and you're there just going, oh, oh, oh. Yeah, um, and uh, but it's the long form stuff that sells cars and sells stuff. As far as I'm concerned, you know, like it's all very well seeing a nice little clip of this and going, "Oh, that's nice." But you want to know about it. You want to live that car, and I think that's what I've always tried to do with my content: is bring everyone along for the journey, uh, whether it's out here in Australia on a vlog, or if I've got a car like that for a week, I want to try and bring you in the car with me and talk about what it is, and I know you do the same, the same sort of thing, it's, 
It's uh, and that that is what I think that's what essentially does sell a car. And what what, what gets people interested in the product is uh, is that sort of living with thing. I'm talking a lot. Sorry. No, you're right. It's all good. Um, so so how are you, Paul? Yeah, good mate. <laughs> uh, you, you touched on uh, Tim just before Shmi. You're good mates with him. Uh, I always sort of read stuff on the internet about uh, how he's come from money and all that sort of stuff, but that's not necessarily the case, right? What do you know of him and, and some of the other big, big YouTubers like Rory Reid, Matt Watson? What do you know about their backgrounds and, and what can you share with us? Sam, who's also in Melbourne tonight, <laughs> which is just crazy. Uh, yeah, so, t I mean, Tim, so it, it's, it's an interesting one with Tim. Uh, a lot of people do pigeonhole Tim Shmi as, as a sort of uh, a rich boy. Uh, from an affluent family, and he is, he's come from a very affluent background, his family have got a fair amount of cash, um, but Tim has always been business driven, I know a lot of his schoolmates that went to school with him, and he used to set up like little makeshift phone shops and he'd be selling mobile phones out the side of his school, and so it's always been about making money and making business, um, and, and his channel, what you see today, he's pretty open with his cars and what he says, like he owns that, and he finances that, and I, I, I dread to think what his finance payments are every month. There'll be, you know, two or three hundred thousand pounds a month, I reckon, some of them. Um, uh, but, but then, so then you can imagine how much he's earning from everything. Um, but he's, he works, I mean, this trip is, <laughs> this trip is, is slowly killing me just from the grind. And, you know, I'm doing nothing like he does in terms of videos. He does a video every day. I think he's done a video every day for the past 10 years, or more than, every single day. Uh, and he edits, even though he's got a big team of people, he edits 99% of his stuff on it, because it's, otherwise it's not efficient enough for him. You know, it's like passing uh, memory cards around, all the rest of it. But yeah, essentially, Tim, what you see is what you get with Tim, and, and everything he's produced is that we're empire of, of cars, or it's a big empire of cars. He has made that happen through graft. Um, but honestly, you spend a few days with him, and you don't envy. You, you, you go very quickly from envying his life to not envying his life because I couldn't do what he does, uh, and it's not to me. It's not. It, he doesn't live enough. He just constantly, you know, goes, goes, goes. He's a machine. So, uh, so yeah. But that's the same. That's that is social media, isn't it? That's the world we live in today. You see so many positive and good things, but there's always a flip side to everything. Uh, and I think I like to talk a lot about mental health, or not a lot. I should talk more about it, but. Um, you know, you don't see the bad days, you don't see the negative things, uh, everything's not as rosy as you think on the outside. Um, and People are bitches on YouTube, aren't they? Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, they are. Call me fat. I'm not fat. No. <laughs> I love KFC. <laughs> yeah, people are horrible, um, but then they're also lovely. They're 99% lovely, and they're 1% horrible, and guess what, you focus on the 1% horrible. Uh, and that's always been the way, and that's what people struggle with when they start YouTube channels. They see the horrible, and you focus on that, and it's like, forget about the horrible, focus on the, the good and the positive, um, but it's easier said than done. Yeah, definitely. Uh, now, before I throw to the floor for some questions, I thought I'd explain just some of the pictures here uh, that Joe and I are in. Uh, so after he came to Australia, uh, I had a trip planned uh, to go to Spain for the launch of the new, well, it was a prototype drive, the new Supra, which I ended up buying after the prototype drive because I loved it. Um, and anyway, on the back of that, we decided to book a couple of cars and go for a drive. And we did, uh, what was the premise? It was uh, four countries in four days or four Alps, four mountains, I don't know. Well, I think I just made it up. It's an excuse to get two really cool cars. <laughs> <Pretty much. laughs> uh, so we picked up uh, R8 Spider and uh, the uh, I8 Roadster in Munich and um, bombed down the Autobahn and, and did uh, gloss, gloss, oh, well, Actually, we, we thought we were doing that, and then that is on the wrong side of uh, uh, that's, <laughs> it. that's it, in the background, isn't that's it? That's it, it's on the <laughs> other side of that. So we did save like 50 euros, which is the cost of doing that. Um, but we ended up doing this amazing road trip. The weather was perfect. Uh, there was no one out there at the time. And what I discovered, thinking that the V10 would be the absolute ball of car, is that the i8 was unbelievable. And I think that is a car that is underappreciated. Oh, no. That's, I don't know what was going on there. Um, so the i8 is such an underappreciated car. It was able to keep up with the R8 on the Autobahn, and, and we were absolutely moving. So that was an unreal trip, and um, had, had so much fun on that. So that was, yeah, it was cool. Oh mate, yeah, it was one of one of those trips that I'll never forget. I mean, I've been we've both been on some amazing trips over the years, and we're uh, getting pictures back of it, especially the one with me and Um, Just a good time. <laughs>